So we're in the middle of chapter 4 of the Lankavatara Sutra. I'll put the text in the notes section below the video. So you can follow along there if you like. And we're halfway down page 184 in Professor Suzuki's translation. Further Mahamati, the Shravakas and Prachika Buddhas at the eighth stage of Bodhisattvahood are so intoxicated with the happiness that comes from the attainment of perfect tranquilization and failing to understand fully that there is nothing in the world but what is seen of the mind itself, they are thus unable to overcome the hindrances and habit energy growing out of their notions of generality and individuality. And adhering to the egolessness of persons and things, and cherishing views arising therefrom, they have the discriminating idea and knowledge of nirvana, which is not that of the truth of absolute solitude. So, there's a lot here. The eighth stage of bodhisattva hood is the eighth bhumi. And the Shravakas and Prajika Buddhas are regarded as less than ideal as far as the spiritual aspirant is concerned. The Shravakas are those that listen and study the words of the Buddha. And the Prajika Buddhas are those that have realized the truth for themselves but don't propagate it. They just become immersed in the happiness that comes from their attainment. And um, I think this is very much where most spiritual teachings go. There are a lot of very good teachers around these days, very insightful individuals just as I'm sure there, there have always been. But it's so easy to find teachers now. Just do a search in YouTube and words of wisdom, words of insight will pour forth. But um, my own feeling is they often don't go far enough. You can tune in to a particular spiritual teacher, you like what they say, you listen to what they say, you, you feel, yes, this is good, I feel good. You might even feel quite high afterwards. And you can read the books, watch the DVDs and the videos, be inspired. But what real change is taking place? Is it possibly not the case that all that's happening is you're getting put into a good mood? It's like listening to a piece of music. You put on a certain piece of music, it has a certain effect. Mm, it's done the trick. Is this it? Is this the size of it? Is this what it's all about? Just getting into a good mood, perhaps for a whole evening. Or you might even go on a retreat, which might be hosted by this teacher and have lots of nice people with a similar mindset around and everybody's behaving really well lovely experience and you come back and your batteries have been recharged ready to get on with all the daily nonsense that you've got to put up with. So like I said I don't feel this goes far enough. There are deep habits, there are moods and there's a general understanding which is not conducive to maintaining spiritual insight. We have a certain understanding about things which is quite different to the understanding we, we feel we might get when we are inspired by our teacher. There's a certain understanding that has to be challenged but the understanding is so ingrained in us we probably don't even know we have it. It's a particular belief about how things are. And it is so basic. It's as basic as the belief that I am a discrete entity wandering around an external physical world. 
who am I spiritual person? I might think, well, yes, it's not like that. We're all one, we're all interdependent, therefore we must look after the world, we must have peaceful relations with our neighbours and so on, and I'm going to work for the good of the planet and all the rest of it, which is fine in itself, but this isn't what it's about. This isn't what it's about. It isn't about interrelatedness. It's about this view of things being completely wrong. And as long as we've got this view of things, then we're missing the point. We're missing the point of spiritual practice. This is what these texts are about. You can attain perfect tranquilization, but fail to understand fully that there is nothing in the world but what is seen of the mind itself. So we are unable to overcome our essential hindrances and habit energy growing out of notions of generality and individuality. So there's generality, that's the world, and individuality, that's the individual. We've got notions which are so subtle, we're probably not even aware of them. But this, is, this next phrase is quite curious. And adhering to the egolessness of persons and things and cherishing views arising therefrom, they have the discriminating idea and knowledge of Nirvana, which is not that of the truth of absolute solitude. But surely adhering to the egolessness of persons and things is what the Buddha teaches, that this egolessness means that things have no intrinsic substance. Well, again, this is a bit like what I've said about adhering to the interrelatedness of things. While it's not wrong in itself, it's missing the deeper point. And it's still adhering to a view. This is the point. You're adhering to a view of how things are. And you invest in that point. You invest in that understanding. You say, oh, this is how things are. And therefore, I shall act in accordance with it. So if I believe things are interrelated, I will act in accordance with it. But the spiritual practitioner is completely independent from this. The spiritual practitioner does not act in accordance with views, or at least does not base their spiritual practice in accordance with views. This was referred to previously as skillfully ascertaining the fourfold logical analysis. That was in the previous video. We don't take our cue from saying, this is that way and this is that way, and therefore I am this way. We're not heading for blissful nirvana. We're heading for the truth of absolute solitude, which was actually referred to as the fruit of Prachika Buddhahood in verse 203. I sometimes feel that Prachika Buddhas get a bad press. But it's the truth of solitude. And solitude, the word solitude has got the wrong resonances here. As if you're somehow deprived by being in solitude. But the truth of solitude is the absolute liberation. It's the liberating fact that we, well, at least from a spiritual point of view, we do not take our cue from anybody else. It's our ultimate freedom. It's like realizing you're in a dream. And when you're in a, and when you realize this, 
it's very liberating the feeling is very liberating the truth of solitude means that you no longer have to take any views into account you are free your behavior is not determined your behavior is not determined by any particular way of thinking because you've realized the truth of what thinking is based on. It's based on pure awareness, which transcends all notions of individuality and generality. Without this awareness, you couldn't even be hearing this. Mahamati. When the bodhisattvas face and perceive the happiness of the samadhi of perfect tranquilization, they are moved with the feeling of love and sympathy owing to their original vows, and they become aware of the part they are to perform as regards the ten inexhaustible vows. I was watching this video recently of a dervish. Somebody posted it or shared it on Facebook. Um, I don't know if he was a Western dervish or not, in a very nice multicoloured skirt, spinning around to some organ music in a church. I found it rather awful, actually. Although the, although the friend that posted it thought it was quite uh, um, beautiful. It just seemed that this dervish I didn't really I didn't really buy into him actually he was just he seemed rather precious and into his own nice little state and expecting even to be appreciated for it he just seemed incredibly self-indulgent the whole thing was a bit peculiar and yet I'm sure this is what some people think passes for being spiritual getting into some state of ecstatic bliss what's spiritual about that no reason why you shouldn't enjoy states of ecstatic bliss but it's no more spiritual than putting on some nice music it's no more spiritual than listening to some Sebastian Bach So yeah, it's great to put ourselves in a good mood, but that's not what spirituality is about. So this last sentence is touching base with the traditional understanding of the Bodhisattva, who's moved with feelings of love and sympathy. This is Metta and Karuna. And I'm not so sure about that. I think the Bodhisattva is just following his own nature which might be perceived as being motivated by love and compassion. But I see it as just the Bodhisattva being very shrewd and not buying second-hand goods. The Bodhisattva knows that there is more. So it's no great sacrifice giving up the bliss of Nirvana, the bliss of the samadhi which sustains nirvana because there's more there's a deeper understanding there's more to penetrate more to realize so the bodhisattva here in traditional terms carries on with the inexhaustible vows professor suzuki reminds us in brackets that there are 10 of these but enlightenment practice is inexhaustible. It always needs to be refreshed. But the fact is that they are already in nirvana because in them 
there is no rising of discrimination. So here nirvana is understood not in terms of bliss and happiness, but in terms of not getting sucked into the discriminating mind. With then the discrimination of grasped and grasping no more takes place, as you now recognize that there is nothing in the world but what is seen of the mind itself. They have done away with the thought of discrimination concerning all things. They have abandoned adhering to and discriminating about such notions as the citta, manas and manavijnana and external objects and self-nature. However, they have not given up the things promoting the cause of Buddhism. Because of their attainment of the inner insight which belongs to the stage of Tathagatahood, whatever they do, all issues from their transcendental knowledge. So it isn't about doing this or doing that or following this and progressing in such a manner. Everything follows from transcendental insight. Your behavior is fresh. Your understanding is fresh. Your practice is fresh.